It's a fact that the Earth is getting hotter. We're having consecutive hottest days on record, prolonged droughts, and migration of warm weather animals to historically colder areas of the planet. This video isn't about carbon, so don't worry about that if you're a climate change denier. It's about the damaging effects of warmer weather on infrastructure that wasn't designed or prepared for it. We're talking about the risk of nuclear meltdown, major loss of power generation, jellyfish, and missed deliveries, delaying major projects. So let's dig in. Overall, the Earth was around 1.47 degrees Celsius or 2.65 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in 2024 compared to the late 19th century, around 1850, which is the pre-industrial average. The 10 most recent years are the warmest on record, and some of the hottest temperature differences are seen in the higher latitudes, like the UK and Northern Europe. So how does that affect the power we already produce? Conventional power generation is usually done by heating water and turning it into steam. So if that water is pre-warmed in our seas and rivers, then it's going to make that process more efficient, right? Less fuel to heat the already warm water to make steam. And that would be right. However, a quick thing to understand is that power plants typically have two water loops. One with pure water in, which we turn into steam, because regular water contains minerals like calcium, among other things, so would leave deposits on the steam turbine or boilers reducing their efficiency and increasing maintenance. That's why we purify the water first by demineralizing it. This is what we call feed water. Because we go through all that effort to make that water pure, which takes time and money, we want to reuse it as much as possible. So once it's been heated and turned into steam and done its work, we use a condenser to cool it down again and change it back into liquid water, back through the boilers and into the steam turbine. The second water loop we talked about that would be river or sea water, and we run that through the condenser in a separate loop like a heat exchanger with the steam to take the heat out and away. It's worth noting that not all power plants use a second cooling loop. And you're probably familiar with the huge cooling towers, which use evaporative cooling to turn the steam back into liquid, losing some of the water in the process. And for other generation types like nuclear, that rely on water for cooling actually benefit from having colder water to the point that the water might be too hot to provide adequate cooling, meaning nuclear power stations are actually switching off on the hottest days when the power might be needed the most, to power extra strain on the grid due to air conditioning and refrigeration. For nuclear plants that are inland and rely on rivers for cooling, prolonged heat with no rain can lead to drought, and rivers not being high enough to cool the plant, again leading to shutdown or even hotter rivers if that water is used and returned to the river, killing wildlife. That's not the only effect of droughts, but we'll come on to that in a minute. To finish off for nuclear power, a lot of these stations are actually on the coast, so they have good access to seawater for cooling. Sea temperature rising means some aquatic animals are actually moving into new areas they historically wouldn't, including a recent event where one of France's largest nuclear power plants had to shut down four reactors due to swarms of jellyfish filling the water filters. The other two reactors were down for maintenance, so this wiped 5.4 gigawatts of power off the French grid, and because the jellyfish breed in warm, still water, like the canals that feed the power plant, the issue is likely to be ongoing. The droughts also naturally mean less rainfall, lowering output of natural hydroelectric power as streams and rivers dry up, and the heat leads to increased evaporation of hydro storage and reservoirs, with no new water to top them up. Veritasium did a great video on the topic years ago, where reservoirs in the USA were using floating balls to block the sun's rays to reduce that evaporation, and I recommend checking it out for the full story. Contrary to people thinking that warm sunny days are the best for solar, solar photovoltaic, or solar PV as it's known, doesn't actually like hot temperatures to function, which can lead to inverters needing more cooling and reduced output. The other type of solar you don't hear about often is concentrated solar, that uses big mirrors to heat water or molten salt, and this type would function better for boiling water but again, there's usually in dry places where you'd want to save as much water as possible and condense it again, so you would suffer in the long run. And wind power isn't off the hook either. Hot air is less dense, meaning it has less effect on the turbine blades, producing less power. And there's actually less wind during hot weather too, producing less power. And I'll drop a link to the study in the top right that shows the correlation between wind power decrease and temperature increase across 75% of the sample. And a terrible fact that most people from the UK will know, 
Less than 5% of homes have air conditioning in the UK due to our mostly temperate climate and of course super high energy price. I don't know about you but with the last few years of heat waves I'll definitely be considering it for my next home. I've got northern blood after all and I don't cope well with the heat down in the Midlands. Transmission is also affected by the heat but not really the focus for today. So to keep it simple the hot weather reduces the capacity of overhead lines as the air provides natural cooling for them and with hotter weather means less cooling. In addition, most overhead lines are made from steel, aluminium or a combination of materials that cause them to expand when heated and then sag. The sag of a line is carefully calculated so under load it doesn't sag too much and end up zapping something, starting wildfires or hurting someone. There are new high temperature low sag conductors available which are composite materials and can run hotter because they don't expand so much with the heat. This allows higher power flows but they're uncommon on the grid at the moment and would take a lot of time and money to replace all existing lines with this composite. We also use dynamic line rating to measure the temperature in real time and that means we can dynamically alter power flows to minimise sag. Cable systems in the ground aren't immune either and some cable systems also require active cooling such as oil filled cables and cables in tunnels to keep them functioning or at good capacity and the heat will put strain on those cooling systems. Likewise, power transformers also generate heat when in use, that is radiated to the surrounding area and hotter temperatures plus grid strain from all these new aircon units and refrigeration could require pumps and fans to run more often. If the pumps and fans fail, which they're more likely to do if they're being run more often, then the transformer needs to be de-rated. We often take 50% of the rated capacity off the transformer to prevent it from overheating when the cooling is degraded like this. Some older transformers might even need pumps and fans fitted to them if the hot weather is going to become the norm. To find out more about transformer cooling, check out my video up here on why transformers fail, where I'll go over the cooling types. Another interesting fact about cooling pumps, on past projects our equipment would typically have two pumps, and we'd run them in a 60-40 duty cycle, meaning one pump runs at 60% of the time and the other 40% of the time. So in a given day that would be 14 hours for one and 10 hours for the other. That way we're deliberately wearing out one pump faster than the other over its life. So we expect that one to need to be replaced first and can schedule that in ahead of time rather than running them both equally and then both potentially needing replaced or breaking at the same time. That'll do for transmission today and I've got a few other videos that cover transmission including things like dual heating, in conductors and heat radiation of cables in my how the grid works video up here. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one, like and comment too so YouTube recommends it to more people. Thank you. Now what about the project delays I mentioned at the start of the video? If you've been on a train in the UK, we're not talking about leaves on the track or it's simply being too hot to work. Those droughts that we mentioned earlier actually reduce the weight you can carry on ships and barges travelling down rivers. And most large assets like transformers typically come from factories abroad and arrive in the UK by boat. A recent example that actually affected liquid natural gas or LNG tankers was at the Panama Canal where a drought reduced the water level by 1.5 meters or 5 feet. This caused delays of up to 6 days for ships, raising costs if you wanted to jump the queue and reducing the ships that pass through by 10% and affecting around 20% of global LNG trade just from Asia to the USA. That's because there wasn't enough water to operate the giant locks which lift and lower ships to travel through the canal and I've seen it firsthand on a previous project where transformers manufactured in Germany were facing a delay because the water level was too low in the river for a barge of that weight to travel down safely. This happened on the Rhine in 2018 and 2022 and also affects fuel deliveries like coal, oil and gas if transported down the river. While we're on the topic of boats and rivers, droughts aren't the only thing to worry about as sea levels have been proven to be rising, with some cities even sinking or being below sea level. But we're more interested in infrastructure and for that the rising waters and flooding will affect ports, reducing their ability to take deliveries of fuels like LNG which is becoming more popular as well as the risk of flooding at places like substations and power plants that are being built on outdated flood risk models. And an example I can give from the current project that I'm on is the converter station that's being built at Wren Hall where the levels have been built up by up to 3 metres to survive a 1 in 1000 year flood risk. So not only is global warming affecting the power we can produce now but it's also got potential to slow down the projects we need for the grid of the future. And with so many countries targeting 2030 and 2035, there's already a production bottleneck for these assets. Another aspect of global warming that is rarely thought about is insurance. I'll not dig too deep into this now, 
but Gunter Fallinger at Alliance, one of the world's biggest insurance companies, is warning that global temperature rises of up to 3 degrees Celsius will make some things uninsurable. That's because events like fire and flood will become too likely to happen. And since Gunter is responsible for investment management and sustainability at Alliance, he probably knows what's going on. This will push the cost or risk onto individuals, businesses and the government. For my UK viewers, you can attest to the heat that we've had recently. And for some of my recent videos, it's been over 30 degrees Celsius outside and over 40 degrees Celsius in this room that I usually shoot my videos in. It's inescapable because of our high latitude, giving us longer days and being on a humid island. But, as well as the heat, we've also been seeing some of the wettest months on record in recent years. A massive flooding to go with it. We can't build yesterday's infrastructure for tomorrow's climate. The good news is we know what to do and we just need to do it. It's cheaper in the long run. What do you think about the recent weather and how fragile our world could seem? And what are your ideas to solve the problem? Let me know down in the comments. And if you've enjoyed this video, like, subscribe and check out some of my previous work on screen. Cheers. If you're interested in more industrial history and technical content, like, subscribe and let me know down below what else you want me to cover. If you want to support me directly and have a bigger say in what videos I work on next, check out my Patreon link in the description. And thanks to my patrons, Benedict, Andrew, Jack, Lionel, Richard, TJ, Colin, Mr. Bear, Nils and James. So let's dig in. Obviously. Make yourself at home, mate. No, you like the new soundproof and dear. Room, room go on in it. Yep, got paper everywhere, pieces everywhere. Thank you. You're not jumping on it. Psst. Have a seat. Take a seat. And for other generation types like nuclear, nuclear. I'm gonna get aneurysm over this word. Nuclear, it's fine. What a pleb. Cat's gonna jump on that in a minute. Mm. That'll do for front. It's been a long day. Dead. Of course, I'm a nerd of a battery storage thing and battery tester and a screwdriver. Retro. Where's all my bats?